everyone. We're going to get started. Um, so welcome to today's Human Rights in Practice event with Kazuko Ito, the Secretary General of Human Rights Now, a Japanese human rights non-governmental organization. Our event today is co-sponsored by the International Human Rights Clinic and the Center for International and Comparative Law. And we also have a couple of additional co-sponsors, the Office of International Studies, the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, Duke Human Rights Center at the Keenan Institute for Ethics, the Human Rights Law Society, the International Law Society, and the Women Law Students Association. And I also wanted to make special mention that Japan, um, the Japan Foundation is also supporting today's event. Before turning the floor over, by way of introduction, Kazuko Ito has been practicing law since 1994. As a human rights lawyer, she works on a variety of different issues, including women's rights, children's rights, criminal justice, and the death penalty. She's also been involved in public interest litigation in Japan, as well as critical human rights issues around the world. Previously, as a Hauser Research Fellow at NYU School of Law, Ms. Ito researched international human rights law and conducted a comparative study of criminal justice systems, which included a research visit to Durham back in 2005. That same year, she also worked for different human rights organizations, including the New York City-based Center for Constitutional Rights. In 2006, Ms. Ito joined Human Rights Now, a Japan-based international human rights NGO, and now serves as its, as its Secretary General. This organization is the first Japan-based international human rights organization to work for the promotion and protection of human rights for people around the world with a special focus on Asia. The organization works on human rights issues using a variety of different techniques, including investigation, grassroots organizing for human rights defenders, solidarity action, and advocacy. And Ms. Ito will share a little bit more about the organization as well. During her talk, Kazuko will speak about the origins of the Me Too movement in Japan, both some of the immediate triggering events as well as some of the underlying issues around gender discrimination in Japan. She'll also speak about the ways in which activists have organized as part of Me Too, and in particular the active role that students have taken in this movement, as well as what the response and some of the backlash has been. She'll conclude with some recommendations, particularly with respect to legal reform, to more comprehensively address gender discrimination in Japan. So please join me in welcoming Kazuko Ito. Uh, thank you very much, Aya, for your kind introduction, and thank you very much for joining us, and thank you very much for Duke for uh, inviting me for this remarkable opportunity. So uh, my name is Kazuko Ito. I'm working as a human rights lawyer for 20 years, and I'm as a secretary general of Human Rights Now, which are kindly as uh, introduced by Aya. Um, human Rights Now was established in 2006 as a uh, uh, first international human rights NGO based in Tokyo, Japan. So previously, uh, there was no human rights NGO based in Japan have a uh, global focus, global agenda at all. So I think I wanted to do something to contribute uh, to the protection and promotion of human rights in the world. So then uh, that's the idea to establish this organization. Once week, I come back from New York. Uh, that was, I was visiting Scala at the NYU School of Law. Uh, 2004 and 2005, I had to come back to Japan and I wanted to continue my activity of human rights. So, uh, you know, I had no choice but establish this organization to continue <laughs> to this, you know, activities. So that's how this organization was found. And then so I got a uh, lots of, you know, uh, colleagues working together for the same purpose. And in 2012, we got UN consultative status. So that's why uh, we are active in the UN, uh, in the UN Human Rights Council and General, General Assembly. So that's how we come sometimes in New York. And I welcome to come back to Duke as well. Okay. Yes. The so area of focus is that kind of area, um, conflict, accountability of gross violation of human rights, business to human rights, child, girl, and human rights defenders, and uh, extensively women's rights. <clears throat> so we work for the in a promotion of women's rights in Asian countries, but we found out that the, our own problem in Japan. 
So、uh, violence against women in Japan、uh, everywhere. So 30% of women in Japan experience violence committed by intimate partners, and rape, sexual harassment, and sexual、uh, exploitation are prevailing problem in Japan. And today's topic is Me Too movement in Japan. How Me Too movement changed this society in Japan? So、uh, Me Too movement, as you know, started in the United States in October 2017. Uh, when I was in the United States and I witnessed how you know rapidly a movement grow up, and I was very fascinated by this idea of Me Too movement, and I went back、uh, in the end of October and start to talk about the Me Too movement happening、uh, in the United States, but the reaction in Japan was、uh, very negative. Yeah, everybody start to talk about why. Me Too movement is not really happening in Japan. That's something media was talking about. And then, so many activists, female feminists, said Me Too movement would be very dangerous movement for survivors because of,、uh, you know, once somebody raises a voice, they would be attacked. They would be very,、uh, you know,、uh, at the risk in Japan. So, because sometimes they expose themselves, they got attack and backlash. So we don't really need to say Me Too movement. That the initial、uh, reaction, even from the feminists. Now, why it happened? So, if silence breakers、uh, speak out her experience, that、uh, she would be the one who is blamed by the society. For instance, you are the guilty one who dressed like that, and you are the guilty one who went to drink with a man. And if it's your fault, but you raise your voice, shame on you. That's the basic attitude of conservative society. And society really blames perpetrators, and society really questions the society norm, which condones sexual violence and harassment. So, but we have the first silence breaker after the Me Too movement,、uh, Miss Yori Ito.、Uh, she's quite,、um, you know, as a young journalist, and allegedly raped by a senior journalist and by biographer of the Prime Minister, Japanese Prime Minister Abe. Yeah, and she filed a case because she was raped by him. But the police reaction was initially it's really difficult, but、uh, she persistently pursued as a case, and the police decide to you know、uh, ask the arrest arrest warrant, and arrest warrant was about to issue, but in the end, this was suspended, arrest warrant was cancelled, and in the end, in you know, a prosecutor. Decided not to prosecute this case. That happened to her. Yeah, and、uh, but this is quite hopeless situation for her. But she、uh, did not give up the situation. And she, you know, this is very exceptional case, but in Japan. But she, you know, you know, exposed her face and her real name, and she, you know, organized her own press conference. And told a story about what happened to her, how criminal justice system treated to her, and she published a book about the name is Black Black Box. You know, she said, you know, the criminal justice system in Japan is kind of black box. So even if you know, as a you know survivor, tell the truth, nobody is pay attention, and also decision making. Is not really, dis- you know, disclosed、uh, to the survivors, and then result is not sus- satisfactory. That's something as she indicated in the book, and then、um, you know she got. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, but what happened after that?、Uh, you know, she got an enormous supporter from the feminist women. You know, even men support to her. However.、Uh, This uh, uh, you know incident is related to the political matters. 
conservative society start to attack her. Yeah. Uh, Twitter and YouTube, yeah, she got, uh, you know, online harassment. And also she got a death threat so many times. So she can't stay in Japan anymore. So uh, she was, you know, forced to relocate to the United Kingdom. So she's no longer staying in Japan. That's happened in Japan. And also she uh, is subjected to the risk to be sued for defamation. Yeah. That's the first case. She's so brave woman, but she got unfair treatment uh, by her raising a voice. That, and then, so this is, uh, you know, um, kind of, uh, the, the, uh, she, her case is not the tip of, uh, it's tip of iceberg. And then the, we have a bigger problem. For instance, you could see that according to the 2014 statistic, <coughs> among women experienced sexual assault, 67% were never consulted with anybody, and 43% consulted with uh, police. And then uh, for women, the police is not really accessible, a uh, second survivor friendly, and cause stressful long hour inter inter interviews, and second rate. And in the end of the day, disappointment result. And then even if women went to police, prosecution rate in rape crime is now less than 30% in Japan. So what's the problem of the access to justice for the victim? Is that either use of force or threat. threat is essential element to establish rape crime in accordance with the Japanese penal code. This is kind of very heavy burden for the survivors. Yeah. So why sexual intercourse without consent are not punishable? That's a question. So Japan uh, in, revised the law of penal code rape law in 2017. The issue was raised. We have to eliminate the element of, you know, use of force or threat in order to establish a rape. Yeah, but, you know, the Ministry of Justice didn't care about that, you know, that kind of allegation at all. Yeah. So we didn't achieve this kind of reform so far. And another essential element of rape is intention. And however, judge determined the fact based on that the prevailing mindset among the men. So sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I believe there was a consent, men said. And then, you know, okay, just said, you know, you know, you are not guilty. You know, you don't have intention. That happened all the time. So this is a very shocking poll conducted by NHK, uh, Japanese National uh, Radio, uh, Broadcast. Uh, and then women's behavior that is deemed as a sexual consent. What is uh, the women's behavior that is deemed as a sexual consent? That was asked by the NHK to many men. And the answer was very shocking. You know, dinner with a man, 11% of men think there was a consent. Drink with a man, 27% of men think there was a consent. Okay, and then, you know, drive with a man, 25. Dress with wedding clothes, 23. And shockingly, dead round, 35% of men think there was a consent. You know, dead round, no consciousness, but there was a consent. You know, I can't believe that the mindset of the Japanese men, lack of education. And based on that mindset, just decide, uh, you know, whether or not intention was involved. Yeah, so we can't have, a, you know, accountability of the sex crimes. So huge impunity about that. That's why Siori case was not really successful. And uh, she got a uh, backlash without any accountability and justice. Yeah. So according to the National Police Agency in 2016, the police accepted, you know, less than 1,000 rape crimes. 
But uh, the cabinet officer returns that the 7.8% of women, 1.5% of men had experience of forcible sexual intercourse <coughs> against their wills. You know, if we, you know, law define that the forcible sexual intercourse itself is a, you know, rape, you know, you know, rape case is more than 1,000, few more than 1,000. But, you know, that, you know, recognized case was 1,000. And then, you know, the prosecuted case was 30 percent. Okay? That's the situation right now in Japan. So, but a theory case was not the last case of the activism of the Me Too movement. We have the second wave. Uh, very last year, uh, April 2018, finance minister, top bureaucrat, committed sexual harassment. That's a huge news, and maybe you heard about that news. And Mr. Fukuda, vice financial minister, invited female journalists to a bar, and when he was asked for information, uh, he responded, can I hug you? And can I tie you up? Yeah, and she said, don't do that. But, uh, you know, this kind of conversation was prevailing uh, with the bureaucrat. Uh, you know, all the time sexual harassment against female reporters and journalists by other bureaucrats. So she can't tolerate anymore. She reported to the TV company she belongs to, but no reaction was taken. So she provided information to the magazine, and the magazine reported and disclosed as a record. She recorded all the conversation. And the magazine disclosed this conversation, <laughs> their online, you know, a magazine post. Then uh, it was a big scandal. And um, yeah, this is Mr. Fukuda. He was forced to resign. And then public got angry. So this is, uh, you know, assembly, uh, you know, organized by the civil society in the diet. Uh, we said we are angry. And then, you know, based on the investigation, and the finance ministry, uh, you know, apologized. This is a typical way to apologize in Japan. They, you know, they admit there was sexual harassment, and then we apologize. And then they invited the female, you know, lawyers, and you know, there was some training course on the sexual harassment. That was not happened uh, in the, you know, ministry at all. So it is kind of, you know, first in training session. Are for at the senior level of the officer in the finance minister. So they are not really, they, are, they seem like reluctant. They are not really happy, but they are forced to do so. Yeah. But the reaction by uh, the ministry himself was very uh, disappointing. So this is, you know, finance ministry and vice president, uh, vice prime minister, Mr. Aso. Uh, he said, he uh, actually uh, defended uh, uh, Mr. Fukuda. And they're saying that there is no sexual harassment crime in Japan. It's not a crime. Yeah, that's something the minister said. And then there's a possibility that Fukuda was tricked. And she, may, she approached to Fukuda for information. And if there are some problems, female journalists can be replaced to male. That's a you know, reaction by the uh, minister. And we, you know, civil society, protest against this kind of remark. No understanding of the you know, problem of sexual harassment and sexual violence at all. Yeah, but she's, she's remain, he's remaining in his seat as a vice prime minister and finance minister. Yeah, this is quite disappointment. And uh, after that, Young people started organizing a rally against sexual harassment after this scandal. And then this woman, young woman, like 27 years old, she's individual. She cannot tolerate this society. And she, you know, called for uh, the rally. You know, let's organize a rally to say something. We are not shut up. So that's the rally. And she, as Larry, uh, talk about her ex own experience of sexual assault. But what happened to her is that she got, you know, online harassment again. 
you know, this is the post. Yeah, some said, you know, she was, ex she, uh, she explained, she was experienced to rape. But some, uh, you know, in an anonymous post said that uh, I wanted to rape her. At the Twitter. Yeah. You know, uh, this kind of online harassment hurt, you know, young feminists, young female activists a lot. Uh, this event was organized by Human Rights Now uh, two weeks ago, uh, uh, celebrating for the International Women's Day. Eh? At the time, she, you know, ex she talked about her experience and she was crying. You know, online harassment affected me a lot. It means, you know, almost one year passed, but she's still suffering from that, you know, traumatized experience of online harassment. <clears throat> yes. But in 2018, last year, we still have a lot of problems. For instance, the medical university have had discriminatory policy against female applicants in admission. That's really an incredible issue, which was secretly implemented for decades. That, that was in you know, rebate very last year. So the other student got angry, and they had a protest in front of the medical, medical university. And then I'm one of the uh, you know, um, attorney team to sue the medical university uh, for the compensation. You know, uh, the, you know, uh, you know uh, discrimination based on the sex is prohibited under the Japanese constitution, Article 14. But this happened. Yeah, it is quite shocking. Yeah. And then, for instance, uh, this is kind of typical, uh, you know, culture and commercial media expression about women. You know, women need to tolerate in the hard work, hard life. Yeah, this is the way of the women in Japan. And also, pop star was, uh, you know, sexually assaulted, you know, last year. And then, you know, but, you know, her management didn't do anything. And then, in the end of the day, she must apologize for being assaulted. This is not her fault, but uh, she, was, she was forced to apologize in front of the audience. Yeah. And then something happened uh, in December last year was, uh, you know, male magazine, this is quite, you know, well-known male magazine in Japan, published a ranking of women courage which men are easy to have sex. Yeah, and then we have a lot of women courage. And then so, yeah, they you know, published the ranking. This university, women are quite open. When we go to drink, you can easily have sex with that, you know, woman. <coughs> So, that kind of ranking. And this is actually a sexual objectification of women in media. So, what happened is the third wave. Yeah, so university student, young university student get together and then, you know, they decide to stand up and protest this kind of, you know, situation in Japan. And they started the change.org campaign and then protest the women courage ranking. Yeah. Yeah, this is a student. Yeah. And then once they start uh, the petition campaign, uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, people get involved. You know, 25,000 people, over 25,000 people uh, join this petition. And then uh, the student group went to uh, the publisher of the magazine and have a conversation. And Fabricia, uh, you know, ultimately apologize their attitude. And then, you know, and then they propose, you know, you have to talk about that, you know, as a consent about sex. And then they agree, you know, our next future would be that, you know, consent, you know, they said, yeah. And then, yeah, there are some constructive dialogue conducted by a student and Fabricia. That's a good example. And then uh, because of this, you know, successful campaign, uh, this experience helped a lot. And then uh, these students established a new organization named Voice of Japan. Yeah. And then they, you know, start to raise a voice in Japan. They don't want to be silent anymore. And then uh, they question 
the sex, sexism prevailing in the society. And now, uh, you know, they are talking about in the campus rape. The, in, J in Japan, there are lots of campus rape, but not indicted at all. So they can't tolerate. So, you know, they start a new campaign, you know, justice for the campus rape. So this is again attract a lot of people. So it seems like you know new you know new people you know young generation uh, start to change our society's culture. That's something really encouraging. So uh, as a lawyer, uh, we are supporting for this kind of activities, and as an organization, we are part of the campaign of the Me Too. So we sometimes support Siori Ito. Last year, uh, we invited her to the United Nations and uh, organized a side event in the UN. And also the, in the UN, we have the press conference and then you know, talk to the international media about what's happening in Japan. And also we always support uh, the activity of uh, you know, young generations. And also, um, we think that the policy reform is very important. So uh, we published a recommendation to the Japanese government. So uh, our recommendation is like this, you know, revise the law related to the sexual violence and eliminate the elements such as violence or threat as a, you know, essential element of the rape crimes. And introduce yes means yes law. You know, the yes means yes means uh, that uh, Swedish new rape law yeah, said, you know, you know, it's a rape. Sexual intercourse is rape, you know, unless the, you know, the women said yes. Yeah, so yes means yes. Yeah. And then so we know that the UK in the United Kingdom say the law, uh, no means no. Uh, this means that, you know, if women said no, you can't go over. So, you know, if women say no, and then uh, though uh, uh, the men do have a sexual relationship, it's a rape. That's a no means no. But in the Sweden new law says yes means yes. You need to get yes in order to have sexual intercourse. That's a new law and it changed a lot of you know the culture. So we encourage this kind of law to happen in Japan. So that's why we invite this is our members of Human Rights Now. And also we invited, you know, the person from Swedish Embassy in Japan. So she talked about that the new law in Sweden. Yes, that means yes. And, uh, and the ILO General Assembly is coming in June. And the ILO is considering to have new convention against sexual harassment. So we are uh, very happy about that process. And we are part of this process. But unfortunately, Japan is one of the few countries that's against the new convention. So we are so sad about that. So uh, we are doing the campaign of the ratification of new ILO convention against sexual harassment. Yes. And also, uh, as you see, that we have uh, you know, universal, uh, you know, medical university uh, discrimination. We don't have the law equivalent to the Title IX in the United States. So we are now having a campaign to enact the law equivalent to the Title IX in the United States. And also, it's really important to do effective measure to protect women human rights defenders and online violence against, you know, rape survivors. That's quite important. Actually, United Nations, uh, you know, Human Rights Council adopted last year the resolution to tackle against online harassment and violence against women. So Japan is a sponsor country of this resolution, but there's no implementation about that resolution at all. So we are now disseminating this you know, very important resolution and ask the Japanese government to take measure to you know, protect the women from the online harassment. That's really important. Thing. And the conclusion is that, you know, Me Too movement is tough to in Japan, especially in case of the theory. She got harassment, backlash, death threat. She's like a refugee right now in the UK. Yeah. But we have to support the silence breaker. If she sacrifices for no pain, that's really bad. 
And if we tolerate, if we say no, if we, you know, are silent to that kind of situation and online harassment against her, backlash against silence breaker, you know, nobody's raised voice anymore. So we wanted to support uh, the silence breakers, you know, and protect them from the online harassment violence. And strike like says uh, the solidarity among survivor activists and people in order to create a society where everybody can raise voice against injustice. So that's something we are working on that. Our challenge is going on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Kazuma. So we'll open it up for um, questions or comments from all of you. in Japan associate the Me Too or Me Too movement with a certain political party. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that that's hurting the movement at all? And how do you work to prevent like politicization? <laughs> so a uh, Me Too movement is not, you know, bipartisan movement, right? Yeah, yeah. It should be neutral. Yeah. So, but uh, in case of theory, there was, you know, uh, the alleged perpetrator was uh, very close to uh, Prime Minister. That's why uh, this case was uh, often used by uh, the uh, opposition parties. Yeah, opposition party, you know, ask a question about her case, say some, you know, uh, the problem happened within the government, and then her case is used for that, you know, um, you know, uh, that attacking the government. So that's why it's politicized a lot. Yeah, but, uh, you know, her intention is different. She doesn't want to talk about that, you know, the political, you know, problem. And, yeah, but she wanted to talk about more, you know, fundamental issue in the justice system in Japan. That's something I talked to you. Yeah, yeah, you know, accountability is not really happening. And also rape, you know, uh, element of the rape is uh, causing a heavy burden to the survivor. That's a fundamental problem. And I wanted to, and we wanted to highlight this, you know, structural problem and legal problem and ask the legal reform that everybody can agree on that. Yeah. So. Hmm. Um, are there a lot of regional differences or is the climate surrounding sexual harassment and assault pretty uniform throughout the country? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, the area, uh, you know, rural area is more conservative and also, you know, very small business you know, and the conservative, very small, old people uh, driven business. There is no sense of, you know, human rights, you know, and also even law, you know, said, you know, sexual harassment must be stopped. You know, nobody pay attention at all. You know, implementation is a different pr problem. Yeah. Mm. So I think that the bigger, you know, uh, business, you know, sector, they have, you know, they are very, you know, they are scrutinized uh, by the consumers and people and media. So that's why they are very sensitive about the issue of sexual harassment. But very small, you know, companies, business entities, especially in the rural area, there's lack of sense of, you know, protection of, you know, women and men from sexual harassment or sexual violence. That's really difficult things. So education is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, first of all, for a very, very enlightening talk. And I have another a regional question that's slightly different, and that is, and I, it may be unfair to ask you to speak about something that you're not directly related to, but recently there was an article by Tammy Kim about the Korean Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And hence my question, which seems to me that there's stronger activism in Korea, but one of the triggering events in Korea was a 2015 mm -hmm. uh, roundup of a pornography ring. And so here's my legal question. Mm -hmm. So this began because the Korean law outlaws pornography. Mm -hmm. And I, is that the case? In I doubt it. Yeah, yeah. Or is, that, is that an issue in Japan? Mm -hmm. This is where the, the, one of the organizations that's 
forward into the Korean Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. So if you have any thoughts about the comparison, I'm mm -hmm. interested. Yeah, so uh, in Japan, you know, there's a uh, liberal policy for, uh, po you know, pornography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pornography, especially adult porn, is prevailing in the society, and that deeply affects uh, the, you know, attitude of men and women, especially men, you know. So that's a big problem. Is there and any law regulating pornography? No. Not, not even against child pornography? Uh, child pornography law. We have child pornography law enacted in 1999, but implementation is very terrible. Yeah. So our organization is working on the uh, pornography issue, but uh, especially as uh, I had no time to talk today, but, uh, you know, as uh, the young female are forced to, uh, you know, entertain as adult porn actress in Japan. This is, you know, kind of, you know, very, you know, serious human rights violations highlighted in, you know, recent years. Our organization is conducting huge research and investigation about the forcible recruitment of young women and young girls to the adult porn industry. You know, they are tricked to get into that industry. And then they were, you know, deceived. They are, you know, they are going to be a model or, you know, a pop star. And then they were thinking they have become a you know, pop star or model. And they signed a contract with some agency. And, but this agency is actually the adult porn agency. And once they get the contract, you know, you got the con we got the contract. You signed the contract. You are obliged to entertain as adult porn actress. And then that happened. And then, you know, my client was run away from the adult porn industry, yes? And then she was sued by the agency, you know, you know, like a uh, you know, half million dollars, so, yeah. yeah. What's the age of consent after which a contract is legal? At what age can a child sign a contract? Uh, yeah, this is uh, 20, 20. 20? 20. 20. Yeah, 20, yeah. Yeah, but, the, you know, the age of consent of the, you know, a sex is 13. 13, yeah. Mm. Yeah, this is a different story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so that happened, and then the court admit, court decision was, uh, it's a kind of landmark decision in 2015 that said, you know, we can't oblige uh, someone to have sex uh, by the contract. Okay, that's a good decision. So yeah, mm. our agency, you know, sues the, you know, uh, you know, you know, the, the survivor victim, but uh, no, this is not allowed anymore. So, but that's the situation in Japan. So then, so we did a lot of work uh, to investigate uh, that, uh, you know, victimization of the women, young girls in the adult porn industry, and it was really a shocking report. And then, so in 2017, the government decided uh, to take measure to prevent that kind of victimization. But that is, you know, just, you know, part of the problem. You know, someone who are not willing to participate to the adult porn industry were forced to, you know, do sex in front of the camera, you know, and this is sold to everywhere. So. That's really difficult. It's a terrible story. But that is now prevent, preventable, you know. There is some policy. But other than that, you know, user pornography is everywhere. Yes, um, yeah. I have a question. So I'm not sure if I understand this correctly, but um, I think I have this idea that in Japan, like, the most long being the situation that like, in a family, Higher status than the wife, and most often the wives are the just housewives, and they don't work outside. So I'm not sure if the situation in like like the bigger social situation about like women having an inferior status in Japan has something to do with like the tradition as in a, within their family they're like inferior to their husband. I'm not sure if that has some connection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, I can talk over and over, but uh, yeah, it's a really long story. Yeah, so, you know, Japanese tradition is, you know, something like that. Uh, and uh, especially after World War II, uh, so uh, Japan's economy was grown up 
But、uh, you know, the model was that men only work very hard, you know, sacrifice himself to that you know economic growth in Japan, and they get good you know salary. And then, in order for men to concentrate to the work, women should be a housewives and contribute、uh, to you know his、uh, business. That's a model that makes Japan successful.、Uh, that was believed by、uh, you know society. Yeah, but、uh, Japan is now aging societies, and then and、uh, we adopt you know we、uh, ratified the CEDO Convention in 1985. And after that,、uh, the discrimination against women in the working place was, you know, prohibited. And the women are start to go to、uh, participate to the, you know, business. But、uh, that's good things. But、uh, it's not really implemented very well. Yeah, because you know, working style is in Japan is very very hard.、Uh, like you know, there is no you know work time limit, you know, limitation. Quite recently, Japan introduced、uh, the limitation of overwork. You know, 100 hours per month. 100 hours per month over time regression. Yeah, but this is very extraordinary. Yeah, and then、uh, if you do, if you continue to work over time, 100 hours per month, you know, you'd be suddenly died. Yeah, that happened in Japan all the time. There is sudden death because of work. Yeah. So it's really, you know, very compatible to the daily, you know, life. You know, for instance, raising children, yeah, you know, take care of families. It's not compatible. So that's why someone needs to be sacrificed. Especially women are giving birth. At the time, she need to take, you know, off, and then she cannot. She has a difficulty to find a place to, you know, put the children. Yeah. And someone who take care of children, it's really difficult to find place to find the place and facilities. There's no you know assistance, so that's why、uh, you know women、uh, without their will has to leave、uh, their business and career, and then、uh, you know it takes like ten years after that, and the kids grown up, and then now I can start to work, but something really remaining is that. <coughs> You know, like part-time work. You know, not well paid, unprofessional job. That something happened to in Japan. It's money trap uh, is uh, you know prevailing in the United States, I believe too. But the situation in Japan is much severe. Yeah, much severe. So and then so that's that kind of you know that's why uh so actually many women uh. Still remaining、uh, to the、uh, you know housewives that create you know discrimination you know sometimes men said you know there's a lot of verbal you know argument in between a、uh, husband and wives and、uh, all the time husband say who take care of you know who is who is paying rent who is paying for food that's something he said to the wives and then very discriminative. And then that is a lesson、uh, to the child, especially men. Just to reiterate、um, the point that Kazuko just made a little bit in terms of some of the historical context, also is that I think.、Um, When the Japanese economy was really booming, a lot of companies gave specific allowances、mm -hmm. to their workers、um, for things like education、um, and childcare and sort of extra income, so that、um, the wives did not have to work, and sort of the allowance would offset、mm -hmm. that.、Um, and so it was. I think the gender dynamics are part of it, but also very much tied to the economic condition of the country. And recently,、um, as that has changed quite a bit. Particularly among、um, you know middle class and lower families who who do now have to be two income earners. So I think there was a point at which,、um, while part of it was about sort of gender dynamics within families, it was also partly、um, the way in which the economy was structured, such that extra income was given with the understanding that the husband would be the major breadwinner、um, and allow the woman to sort of have the time to stay at home and, and care for the family. And that's I think changing out of necessity now. Sorry for this、um, earlier opinion, a bit late. But what is the climate for NGOs, for civil society working in Japan, like on human rights issues generally, and on Me Too issues in particular? 
-hmm. Yeah, a me too issue uh, with uh, much more well respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but other issue like you know human rights. Human rights is kind of you know that the under current administration, uh, frankly speaking, it's really you know they say think you know the human rights is very dangerous concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. you know, especially uh, for for instance, uh, you know, my organization is working with uh, the United Nations, and then also we try to get, uh, fill the gap in between international human rights standard and Japanese, you know, practice. And then so you know, all the time people say I'm anti-Japanese, you know, propagandist, <laughs> and then just you know, uh, say anything about the, you know that uh, defaming Japan, you know, attacking Japan. So with with some um, political motivation or something like that. So that sometimes you know, uh, all the time Japan uh, Japanese government is not really happy with the UN recommendation. You know, they and they use some you know uh, conservative people to attack against uh, NGOs, especially human rights NGO. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, if there is no NGO human rights NGO in Japan, situation is getting worse. So and uh, everybody knows the situation. It's getting getting very you know difficult. Yeah. Mm. So that's why uh, people think that you know human rights NGO has some reason to exist as based. Yeah, but, uh, and also the problem of funding, funding, you know, so, you know, many people want to, you know, donate to the charitable organization, but they don't really want to, you know, you know, donate to the, you know, human rights NGO. That's really difficult thing. Yeah. And how do you navigate those challenges? when you have funding constraints, how do you work? Yeah, that's really difficult. Yeah, but, uh, you know, we, you know, we, uh, some of the campaign we do is that we work together with, uh, you know, as the young generations. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they're, the, they're playing a formidable role in Japan to, you know, open the society. And especially uh, these girls are grown, grown up in the other countries and come back to the Japan. And they have clear, you know, mind that, that something is wrong uh, in Japanese tradition, and then they are not hesitant to raise a voice. And then that kind, you know, that the silent majority are not really happy with current male dominant discriminative society. And then nobody, uh, you know, it's really difficult society to raise a voice, even if you think, uh, you know, situation is really awkward, you know, it's really, you know, unreasonable. So nobody can, you know, raise a voice. That's not healthy at all. Yeah, many people are so frustrated, but uh, you know there's some fear to say something because online violence, uh, backlash, etc. Even men are afraid of you know uh, saying something real. So, yeah, so uh, that's why you know uh, that this kind of young generation uh, you know uh, say something vocally that help a lot to the society. And uh, we wanted to. Uh, we we now we are now uh, working together with young generations, and also uh, we have some educational curriculum uh, for young generations. And then uh, so, especially uh, you know, like the uh, age of you know uh, ten to you know uh, teens and uh, twenty something, they are the good you know generation. And then they are more liberal compared compared to you know all the generations. So we concentrate to that you know kind of human rights education and also dissemination of idea of women's rights issue and me too uh, to this kind of generations. So encourage the society is very important. So funding is very difficult things. And so, but uh, funding is related to things that we work together with uh, some business entities. Business sector, so because we work on the business and human rights as one of our project, mm -hmm. and then some of the you know uh, the business you know community are very you know are keen to that protection of human rights. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then they know the trend, you know international trend of business and human rights. They wanted to follow the international rule and trend and you know yeah norms, and so they often work together with us. That's how we wanted to survive, and we wanted to, uh, you know, open the way. 
I wanted to ask um, a couple of your recommendations. I thought it was very interesting that yeah. borrow from legal practices in other countries. Mm -hmm. So yes means yes from Sweden and Title IX from the US. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if your organization, if one of your strategies is to sort of explicitly look to legal standards in other countries mm -hmm. when fighting for legal reform in Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm. That's, yeah. that's something we are doing. So we have uh, three missions. One is uh, to address the human rights, uh, serious human rights situation in other countries outside Japan. That is mission one. And uh, mission two is to, you know, contribution uh, to uh, the, the improvement and development of international standards and norms of human rights in the UN. So that's something we do. And thirdly, mission three is to fill the gap in between international human rights standards and Japanese domestic, you know, practice. So we often, uh, you know, uh, go to the UN, and because of that, the UN at Human rights treaties observe the situation in Japan and make specific recommendations. So we wanted to uh, highlight this kind of recommendation, to so ask the government to implement these kind of recommendations. And sometimes there is no you know, human rights norm at all. For instance, me too, there was no human rights norm was established. I wanted to push international human rights norm on me too and sexual violence. That's another story, but uh, once international norm was established, we wanted to you know, incorporate that into our Japanese practice. That's something we do. And also, in order to see that, you know, uh, in case of Me Too, there's no you know, standard so far. Yeah, and then so that's why we look at other countries, good example. For instance, how is a law in the UK, US, uh, U.S. is very tricky. It's different from the states to states. But uh, we, you know, we try to find a good example of the U.S. law and Swedish law, Finland law. So we did, uh, you know, uh, this year we conducted, last year we conducted 10 countries a uh, comparative study of the sex crimes and sexual violence. Uh, that was, uh, we have a lot of pro bono lawyers involved with our research project. And then we compile the report and make a recommendation uh, to the government. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are the professional human rights NGO. That's why uh, that the, all the you know about partisan uh, you know MP are listening to our you know, recommendation. So yeah, that's yeah, good. Any other last questions from the audience? Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much.